All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Sean Doyle, who is in Birmingham, Alabama. How are you doing, Sean? John, thrilled to be here. I've been looking forward to this for oh, a couple of weeks now. Oh, fantastic. And Sean is the co-founder, principal and director of strategy with the, with, at Fitzmartin. And today we're going to talk about cognitive marketing. But we're just going to start off. We're just going to, um, um, Sean's going to give us a brief overview of cognitive marketing. And then we're going to, we're going to get down into the area of commitment. So all you commitment phobic people out there, you're going to learn today. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I feel like a lot of people just turn the episode off. Yeah, John. exactly. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you for having me. I've been um, a fan of Sales Pop and a great podcast. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, my mother probably taught me at one point, never be on the air with somebody that has a fabulous accent. And uh, I'm totally <laughs> blowing that. Nobody's going to listen to a thing I say. I could just listen to you talk. No, they're all bored of me, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, I work at uh, Fitzmartin, as you mentioned, and I think what's in, what will be interesting to your listeners and be helpful, most important, will deliver value to your listeners is our point of view in the world. So before you hang up going, oh, here's another marketing schmuck talking, uh, listen to this. So, so we are a sales first company. We believe that we exist to support sales, just like Pipeline or CRM, right? We exist to support sales. And uh, our company is has twofold parts. It has an advisory component where we come in and help people identify barriers to sales that could be functionally driven in a marketing department. It could be uh, marketing and sales alignment and off talked about mm -hmm. subject, or it could be operational where we're coming in and helping people with marketing technology, revenue operations, creative operations. All of that is sales first. So the point yeah. though, I think of what makes it interesting and what we want to talk about today is our point of view and our point of view is substantiated by science. Uh, I've gone into too many meetings. You've, have, John, have you ever met a marketer who had a point of view and you just rolled your eyes? Oh, um, absolutely. And I love the fact that you say, you know, marketing exists to support sales, because I think when I think if marketing people can embrace that idea, I think life becomes a lot simpler for them. I think this you know, these, these demarcations and trying to be an entity in, in, in and of itself, um, you know, in an organization, you're, you're there to help sales. And, and that's why, unfortunately, you know, sometimes in organizations, you'll have sales, we'll call them the sales prevention department. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. That's great. I've probably been accused of that at some point, right? Um, yeah, and I think uh, you see today in business the idea of uh, revenue operations, uh, chief revenue officers. Mm -hmm. You start seeing people who are saying, let's mash up sales and marketing, and mm -hmm. by, by doing that, maybe we'll create alignment. I actually think that's a mistake. Um, mm -hmm. I think you should have two points of view. You should have two departments, but we're not here to talk about operational organizational models. Uh, if you want to call me, if you want to hear about my opinions on that. Um, I want to tell you the, the framework that we worked in. So in 2002, uh, I became really ill with a, a chronic illness. I still, I'm here, I'm doing very, very well. Um, but it caused me to rethink the world. And one of the ways I was rethinking was I was that typical ad agency, that typical marketing company. And I knew that on t at times we were successful and at times we created money and value for our clients. But I did not know how to repeat it how to teach it, how to come in and work with sales one-on-one. -on -one. And at that period, then I discovered this idea. It's, it's, a, it's a mouthful, you ready? The mm -hmm. trans theoretical theorem of behavioral change. And that wow. is the basis, that is the science. It's very important, trans theoretical. It really is, that's important. <laughs> um, it's not really, it, the book was not written, that science was not written. The, the book I'm referring to is called Changing for Good. You could probably mm -hmm. get it online for a buck. Yeah, it's an old book. Um, but it talks about how, from all points of view of behavioral science, uh, how do people change from doing one thing to doing something else? 
specifically the science was rooted in the science of, of quitting smoking of all things. That seems like an antiquated idea in today's day, um, but it was not in the 70s. So uh, I, I read this science and I thought, wow, there's this pattern that we all go through. And I, I think everybody probably listening gets the consumer decision journey. You know, there's stages, sure. there's steps we all go through in the CDJ. And McKenzie did a great job of defining that. What I didn't have was a way to know how to motivate people to go through the consumer decision journey. As a marketer in 2002, I was looking at things like emotional arousal and getting people excited and rational reevaluation, mm -hmm. maybe giving a testimonial, uh, maybe doing some consciousness raising. And those are three of the nine scientific processes that do help people move forward. But there's nine processes what I learned in 2002 was what I didn't know how to do was support sales with the five processes that work later stage. In other words, you could create awareness. John, if I create awareness of this mm -hmm. science that it exists, it doesn't do a thing, really. Yeah. You know it exists, but who cares? <laughs> Until I can take you through emotional arousal, rational reevaluation, and get you to begin to prepare to change your behavior, to get you to say, huh, I need to learn more about this. I want to dive into this. I want to maybe go to a, a seminar or learn something online or maybe even engage in a company that has a, a point of view like this and learn mm. more. So I mean, just all one, the awareness just, just, doesn't just one change thing on, what, Yeah, one thing on that, Sean, I think it's just it's really important for people listening is that, uh, you know, we always talk about losing to the competition, right? But we, but we lose a lot of times to no decision. You know, no decision is often our biggest competitor and it, and it just reinforces what you say there. We may create the awareness, maybe a little bit of intrigue, but we never take them to the point of where they have emotionally decided they have to do this. And somewhere there's a skeptic going, ah, John's not right, but I can, I can convince you of it quickly. Who listening wanted to get in shape or lose some weight? recently maybe even mm -hmm. <laughs> and you put yeah. it off we all weaken our wills to make change we all uh, put off action too long or we rely on willpower to make a change well okay so let's put that in context so we're, we're a business focused on b2b changes so mm -hmm. b2b changes are complicated there's multiple decision makers there's influencers there's primary decision makers, there's different points of view. That's why the structure has been put up that way. Or even worse, procurement. But we're gonna save procurement for another day, another <laughs> yes, whole conversation. Please, please Cause let's that gets that. into power and positioning <laughs> and yeah, the best of salespeople often can't overcome procurement, but, mm -hmm. but marketing actually can overcome procurement. So if you wanna do a talk another day, we'll talk about that. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, yeah, the idea of helping all those people in a B2B uh, context, change the way they're doing business, buy a new vendor's business, buy a, pr a product or a service from somebody else than the way they're doing it today, that is a behavioral change. So what I wanted to focus on in this brief episode is commitment, this idea of commitment. So why do I keep putting off this behavioral change? I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to drink less. I'm going to whatever. So, well, I mean, short term, the science teaches us that we get a very brief relief, right? We get a little release of, oh, I made that decision. I'm mm -hmm. ready. I'm going to do this this time. And then we all know what happens, right? A month later we go, I haven't lost a pound. I'm still having yeah. too much. I'm, ah, you know, nothing changed. But that, that release, that willpower kind of clicks it. So as a salesperson or the best of marketers understand how to support sales through these processes, as a salesperson and as a marketer, what you want to do is help people make tough choices. And that is interesting. So we break down commitment into two steps and it's supported by the science. There's a private commitment and then there's a public commitment. So John, what's, uh, you're gonna have to make up something fast here, John. <laughs> what's something that you corporately wish might be done? Let's say it's a big decision that's gonna involve many executives. Um, poor. well, I mean, I guess seeing as we sell a, we sell a, um, we sell a CRM, I mean, that's the one that's like people buying CR, buying a CRM. That's a multi decision maker oh, process, multi influencer wow. process. 
Yeah, that would be what the CFO is going to look at this, the CEO is going to look at the SVP yeah, of sales. The, the VP of sales, you know, possibly, you know, the possibly uh, marketing are going to have some input as well, IT. So, yeah, so there's a lot of different people. And then obviously, I mean, that's why we built uh, uh, the buying center within, uh, within the CRM itself, where you can map out all these people and how they influence the sale. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's a multi, it's a multi influence uh, process. And one of the most important things is to figure out who is influencing how and why, and it's not always positive. Absolutely. Right. Um, yeah. Cause what's said to your face, I, I remember one of my early sales coaches said rule number one, customers lie. Yeah, I thought that was a, a little <laughs> cynical, but um, yeah. I don't know, maybe it's true. Uh, so what would I do as a marketer trying to help uh, you guys sell pipeline or CRM? Mm -hmm. I would work with sales and say, there's a step here that you need to take. And it's a private commitment first before a public commitment. Why is that? So why do I not declare on Facebook when I'm going to lose weight or do a Instagram or a, I guess today yeah. I do a TikTok. Right. So yeah. uh, why, would I, why do I not do that? My first declarations are private. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to make a decision myself. So if I'm going to swap my CRM, let's say I'm going to get out of that big monster who we won't talk about, who's taking over <laughs> the globe. If yeah. I want to move away from that, I'm moving away from somebody with a lot of press, a lot of reliability, a white sheet of paper, a lot of flexibility. And often those are the things in my experience that make it so daggum hard to use and so expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got to take people through a process of change. So John, if I was selling to you and I said, John, I want to bring Pipeline or CRM into your company. Tomorrow, will you set up a meeting with the CEO, CFO, SVP of sales, maybe two or three other people that use the product, and I'm going to present to everybody. What are you going to say? We've just met. Yeah, I'm going to say, well, maybe we want to back up a little here. Right. <laughs> so marketers and salespeople need to understand, I've got to get John to make a private commitment before mm. he's going to make a public commitment. And that sounds like a nuance. But remember, we just talked about the complication yeah. that B2B has. So if we've got to get everybody to go through this journey, I've got to get John. We talk a lot about find an inner advocate, find a, a person on the inside that's going to. But what we're talking about is the behavioral science of change. And what we're saying is get the person internally to lower their risk because John, in this case, doesn't want to risk that I'm an idiot. Yeah. I'm a sales guy. <laughs> a lot of sales guys have uh, their own interest in mind, not their prospect's interest in mind. So sure. before John exposes me to the CEO, the CFO, the SVP of sales, he's got to know that he is secure, that his risk is, in fact, you can move into an emotional arousal. We talked about value briefly. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the value propositions is an emotional contribution. So what if in sales and marketing, I can show John, John, if you'll take a private commitment, look at this CRM system, I'll show you how it works. And in the process, I'm showing John three or four other people that moved from SVP where mm -hmm. he is up to ESVP. You know, they, I'm showing yeah. John how other people who made this decision advanced their career. I'm selling value that's very private, that's very rational, it's very emotional to John. So I'm creating safety that he can take me in a good way with rational thinking to his peers and he can advance his career through this decision. Well, yeah, how many I, marketers do you know that, that sit through that process with sales and talk through it? There's tools marketers should be providing. And that's, that's my passion. I'm sorry, I'm getting wound yeah. up here, John. No, no, it's great because I always say to people is that you have to understand that in a B2B, uh, in a B2B sale, the decision can be career enhancing. Like you just said, you bring in a fantastic product. It, it really enhances everything, which of course pipeline would. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, everything goes great. Or, or you bring in, as you say, you bring in somebody, the whole thing bombs or whatever. Now you're suddenly, your, your, your trust within the organization has depleted. It can be career limiting. And that's why I was saying that, I always say to people, there is a lot of emotion involved and we should never ignore that. You know, John, another, uh, speaking of emotion, so salespeople can, and marketers too, and it's not mm -hmm. just one party, can be guilty of saying we've got more deals farther down the pipeline than we really do. Yeah, and then those course. pipeline reports aren't all of that exactly mm -hmm. correct. And we wonder why our projections didn't happen. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because emotionally we want to say we're doing better perhaps than we are. Well, a great question an SVP of sales can ask or a CMO can ask or any executive can ask is, hey, this deal with John to, to get the CRM system in, has he made a public commitment yet? Has he gathered other people in the deal? That's a great question because people can yo-yo just like I have with my weight loss and my desire mm -hmm. to quit smoking and my quit, you know, I got to drink less and all this stuff. I mean, I can keep yo-yoing on that decision for a long time. So what a great trigger that's scientifically based to find out where your deal is in the pipeline. Has John shown the system, shown the product, shown your presentation to the, any of the other decision makers? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, then the deal is the earlier stage than it might be being reported. Yeah, no, I, lo I love that because, um, and I think people, it's a very simple concept. You think because you're using, you know, weight loss or say, say I tell you today, oh, I'm going to run a marathon this year or next year. It's probably isn't any marathons right now. Um, <laughs> but if I go, if I go, I don't do Facebook, but if I put it on Instagram, for instance, if I put it on Instagram that I'm going to run a marathon on January 23rd of next year, right? I've made a public, I've made a public commitment. I'm now going to have people, you know, the, the two or three people who follow me, I'm going to have them coming after me saying, oh, how's, it, how's your training going? When is the marathon? Or, you know, afterwards, did you do it? Um, if I just say it to myself, I don't have to do it. Right? Right. Right. And I think this idea of public private commitment is, is one that I we hope everybody takes away. I think that's a great analogy and, it, and it's a great question to ask. Have you have, you know, has this, has your contact shared this with anybody else? Like have they made a public almost endorsement of you? So if sales recognizes the difference and acts that way, there's a playbook that established then and marketing, man, here's my challenge to your listeners. If your yeah. marketing department or your marketing firm doesn't even know how to talk like this, you've got the wrong firm, <laughs> unless you just want a marketing group to create awareness. Mm -hmm. If you want to commit all of your resources, and I'd say in our sales barrier analysis, using the cognitive marketing framework, 80% of our clients are investing too much money too soon in the sales cycle and not enough later in the sales cycle. So they wonder why they don't close more deals. Well, they're not equipped late stage. So man, if you, if you have a point of view as a marketer, if I'm interviewing an agency, if I'm interviewing a CMO, I'm going to ask them one question, actually four questions. I just got mm -hmm. published by a rock bench out of Nashville and shift. You can find it on Amazon. Um, and uh, you can look um, there and you can see four questions. But one question is, if I'm interviewing John Golden to be the CMO, I say, John, talk me through a sale. And I'm talking about from pre-contemplation all the way through to customer success and advocacy. Every marketer can talk through the beginning. Every agency sure. can talk through the beginning. If you can't talk through the end, then you're hiring an incomplete resource. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fantastic uh, that's a fantastic point as well, uh, because if if a if a if a marketing person doesn't understand the whole of the as you say the whole of the sales process the stages of the sales process the decision making process of a buyer all of those things then how can they support how can they support sales? It would be like hiring a chief financial officer that knows how to book the revenue but doesn't know yeah. how to do taxes or. <laughs> You know, I don't, I, you get it. You get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Com company would be short lived. That's for sure. Short lived. <laughs> short lived. I do believe my po the negative point of view is marketing it doesn't always know what it's doing to support late stage sales. Mm -hmm. And that's why we built Fitz Martin to be focused on that and to be sales first. The positive point of view is if you're not, if your company, if you're listening to this going, oh, mm -hmm. my company sounds a lot like that unequipped to support the whole way through the funnel. Mm -hmm. Good news is there's a lever you can pull that hasn't been pulled before and you're gonna get more value out of improving that department. You probably cannot improve accounting, distribution, sure. production. You probably can't improve all that all that much. Marketing often is this lever that, that can be massively, and marketing technology, like a good CRM system supports that, you know, there should be marketing technology through this entire funnel too. Yeah. Maybe that's a good second question. Explain in this interview with your agency or in this interview with your CMO, say, explain to me the marketing technology that supports the entire sales cycle 
And if they can't break that down, I mean, come on, you got the wrong person. You're interviewing the wrong person. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love it. And and I would say to um, marketing people too, is um, if you want to understand sales and you want to learn more is just join sales meetings. I mean, ideally like join, um, go and listen in on, on calls with prospects, but at the very least, uh, your sales or your sales team has weekly meetings, whatever, just ask mm-hmm. to be part of that. You don't even have to speak, just listen in. Yep. And after a couple of weeks, you'll realize how, how little you probably know about the real, their day-to-day reality, but how much over time that will make you such a better marketer. One way to demonstrate how different Fitzmartin is, is when we have a new client, I have our creative team, in addition to our advisory services team, go ride with sales. And by ride with sales, I mean you get in the truck and you go spot (laughs) to spot. I I just uh, a few months ago got back from Denver and I did, did a lunch, sales lunch. I did a couple cold calls. And I'll tell you the value that came out of it was by sitting with the sales guy, a guy named Trace in this case, mm-hmm. by sitting with Trace, I discovered that the marketing tools that we had provided them were not the right tools. So we mm-hmm. took uh, an initiative last quarter to rebuild those in the field Salesforce tools so that sales wanted them and added value and it revolutionized the way that those sales tools looked and worked. That just, yeah. And those were late stage tools. I mean, so you got to ride with these guys. I mean, yeah. it sounds antiquated, but get out of oh, the office. Yeah, <laughs> get out of the office. You can virtually ride with them today. It's all good. Uh, Absolutely. But it's all, I tell you, a good clue always is um, if, if you provide a lot of material to sales and the first thing they come back and ask you for editable versions of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. Now, there's a, we did work for a bank once that uh, we had to lock down the PowerPoint because the guys did keep editing it uh, to the point that wasn't telling the truth. But uh, yeah, unless you're in a, if you have a fiduciary responsibility, lockdown's okay. Uh, yeah. But, you know. um, listen, Sean, this has been fantastic. Uh, the time has flown and I think there's a lot more we could talk about. So hopefully you will come back and, and talk again. Um, all of Sean's information be in his contributor bio, all the links. But before we go, uh, just a last couple of words about uh, what you and Fitzmartin do. Well, as I said, we're an advisory services company. And coming out of that strategic point of view, we help operationally with revenue operations, creative operations to support sales, sales first, scientifically inspired marketing consultancy. And man, we exist to drive revenue and we love it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and I, Learn um, more. Come yeah. over to fitzmartin.com, uh, F-I-T-Z-M-A-R-T-I-N.com. Or uh, I have a website called Sean M. Doyle, S-E-A-N-M-D-O-Y-L-E. And on that site, you can actually get a video that explains cognitive marketing in uh, less than five minutes, probably like three minutes. And uh, it changed my world to full circle back to 2002. Uh, it's repeatable. It works. We can track revenue and consistently are able to help our clients. So dive in and learn. Read the book, Shift, S-H-I-F-T on Amazon. That's about all the plugs I could think of, John. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I love it. And I'll, I'll deliver it very succinctly too. Yeah, I would encourage you to go over to fitzmartin.com. You'll even see Sean resplendent in a bow tie there. It's very, <laughs> very, very dapper. <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah. All right, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline CRM. Thanks again, Sean. I'll see you all for another expert interview soon. Look forward to it.